Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140, Human Physiology. This is the Cellular Metabolism video, part two. So before we get any further into this video, I want you to know that I'm going to assume that you've watched part one and that you know all of the information from part one well. Maybe not perfect, but well. The two parts for this video, with part one, we followed the story of a glucose molecule going through glycolysis, then going through activation, then going through citric acid cycle, then going through electron transport chain, producing ATP all along the way. And you probably noticed that I was skipping through slides a whole bunch. And I even mentioned that we're gonna come back and kind of add things in here and there. For this video, I'm going to assume you know what glycolysis is, you know what activation is, you know what citric acid cycle is, and you know what electron transport chain is. You know the story of one glucose molecule. Um, I also want to remind you of how I think it's best to learn this material. You want to compartmentalize it. And by that, I mean, if you look at the whole big picture, it can be a little overwhelming and a little, wait, where's this piece go? Where's this piece go? You can kind of get things mixed up. You want to take glycolysis and put it in the glycolysis box. And then you want to take activation, put it in an activation box. Then take citric acid cycle and like learn citric acid cycle by itself. Then put that in the citric acid cycle box. And then see how they interact, see how they connect. That's the best way to learn this. So let's jump right in. So glycolysis. Glycolysis means sugar splitting. It's the process of splitting a sugar. You go from a six carbon glucose into two, three carbon pyruvates. It happens in the cytosol. You spend two ATP, you make four ATP for a profit of two ATP. Substrate level phosphorylation describes when a phosphate group is transferred directly onto the, um, from the substrate onto ADP turn it into ATP. And this is what happens in glycolysis. The ATP that is produced in glycolysis is considered substrate level phosphorylation production of, of ATP. So adenosine diphosphate has two phosphate groups. Adenosine triphosphate has three phosphate groups you're adding that extra phosphate onto ADP to turn it into ATP. With substrate level phosphorylation, we have an enzyme that facilitates the transfer of this phosphate group directly onto ATP. I want you to know that it's substrate level phosphorylation that occurs in glycolysis. I'm gonna give you a little heads up also. Substrate level phosphorylation is also what happens to produce ATP in the citric acid cycle, aka Krebs cycle. Same situation, you have an enzyme which helps facilitate a reaction that transfers a phosphate group onto ADP, turn it into ATP, substrate level phosphorylation. There's only one place in this story where we see something other than substrate level phosphorylation, and that's the electron transport chain. So if you just remember, electron transport chain is different, it will, we'll get to it, is not substrate level phosphorylation, and everything else is substrate level phosphorylation, you'll be good. All right, so substrate level phosphorylation, phosphate is transferred directly from substrate to ADP. So, perfect. All right, so we've got our glycolysis box. We're now gonna take left or right. You're gonna have to go anaerobic, which happens in anaerobic, which means without the use of oxygen, or aerobic, which means with the use of oxygen. Now, 
Which one of these is happening in your body right now? The correct answer is both. Inside of a human, both of these are always happening. Anaerobic and aerobic respiration is always happening within humans. Constantly, always. So, anaerobic does not use O2, aerobic does use O2. Let's look at anaerobic first. So anaerobic is sometimes called fermentation. It is similar to the process of uh, like yeast fermentation, alcohol fermentation, um, but there's some, some difference in enzymes, which makes it so that we get pyruvate and lactate, sorry, not pyruvate, which makes it so we get lactate instead of like ethyl alcohol. So, perfect. So with anaerobic respiration, we go through our glycolysis as normal. We have two ADP, we profit two ATP at the end, we have two pyruvates, we also have two NADHs. Now, NAD plus is required for glycolysis. So what do we do to regenerate our NAD plus? We combine NADH with our pyruvate, which gives us lactate, and then turns our NADH back into NAD+, which can help with glycolysis again to help the reaction persist. Help the reaction persist. Anaerobic is beneficial because it's a rapid ATP yield. So we can get ATP quickly. It's a small yield, but it gets ATP quickly, and it does not require O2. But once again, I want to point it out, it still happens in the presence of O2. So it's still happening within our body. Now, what happens to that lactate? What happens to that lactate? Well, that lactate doesn't go to waste. So right here, we have in our muscle, we have glucose, glycolysis, we get pyruvate, which then gets turned into Lactate, well, lactate is going to go into our bloodstream and go back to our livers. Lactate is going to go into our bloodstream and go back into our livers. And in our liver, it's going to undergo something called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. Gluco meaning glucose, neo meaning new. Genesis is like the book in the Bible, the creation. So we're making new glucose, the creation of new glucose, gluconeogenesis. So we're going to take that lactate and we can actually create more glucose out of that lactate. Our livers can turn that lactate that we produce back into pyruvate, then back into glucose. Now this does consume energy, but it allows us to have you know, the lactate not go to waste, and then we have more glucose, you know, for later on. The energy stored in lactate can still be used by our bodies. Gluconeogenesis. So right here's the summary chart. Know your summary charts. Know what goes in, know what comes out. I expect you to know these summary charts. All right, so right here, I gotta move some, some windows around. During fasting, glucose is synthesized from glycolytic intermediate. So uh, glucose is the primary energy source of our brain. So our brain is very picky about what it uses for energy. And our brain loves using glucose for energy. Adequate levels must be maintained. So as we've talked about before in this class, there's a set point for blood glucose levels. There's an ideal level needs to maintain for proper homeostasis. One way that our body can produce, can get more glucose is through gluconeogenesis. So this is what I just mentioned. We can take our lactate, our liver can turn it, we can take the lactate, which is the byproduct of anaerobic respiration. Our livers can turn it back into pyruvate, which can turn it back into glucose.
gluconeogenesis, it's a vocab word. You probably will see it on the test. Glucose from glycolytic intermediates. Basically, you run glycolysis backwards. Yeah, that's a good way to think about uh, gluconeogenesis. It's glycolysis backwards. And this is one way that our body can get more glucose when it runs low. The rest of this slide, we're going to come back to. I want to now draw your attention down here, down here. So another way that our body can help maintain proper glucose levels is by the use of glycogen. So glycogen is like a chain of sugar molecules. It's like a chain of glucose molecules. And it's a storage molecule for these simple sugars. Glycogenolysis is glycogen lysis, glycogen cleaving. Glycogenolysis is the breakdown of glycogen. This is when you break off sugars from glycogen and produce more glucose, which you can use for glycolysis. So if your blood sugar goes low, you can do glycogenolysis, which, produce, which turns glycogen into glucose, more simple sugars. You can also do gluconeogenesis to produce more glucose. Another vocab word here is glycogenesis, glycogenesis, and that's the synthesis or creation of glycogen. So we've actually seen this before in this class when you're talking about systems and homeostasis. Uh, one thing that we were talking about how insulin and glucagon uh, help balance levels of glucose. And one thing we said was that you can produce more um, glycogen when your blood sugar's levels go get high. You put that extra glucose into storage. That's this word right here, glycogenesis. If you have excess glucose, your body will store some of it as glycogen, glycogenesis. Now, you've, I want to point something out. Students often miss words, miss points on the exam because glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, and gluconeogenesis and glycolysis all look and sound similar. They do. And so I'm pointing this out because students have made those mistakes before on the exams. Pay close attention to all those words. Read those words slowly and carefully every time you see them on the exam because you will see, you will most likely see all of them on the exam. So be ready. All right. So I want to point out another place that we can make new glucose from. So right now, you can make new glucose. You can have, I mean, you can, if you want to raise your blood sugar levels, you can do glycogenolysis so we can break down glycogen to get more glucose. We can do gluconeogenesis with lactate, with lactate. We can also do gluconeogenesis with a part of a fatty acid. So, Fatty acids have the glycerol backbone. Sorry, try, not fatty acids, triglycerides. Triglycerides have this glycerol phosphate backbone. And then these triglycerides, these, you know, fatty, these, these lipid tails that come off. These lipid tails that come off. This glycerol backbone can be broken off the uh, fatty chains. And look at this, three carbons, just like lactate, just like pyruvate, it can be in a component of gluconeogenesis, of making new glucose. There are also some amino acids, which we'll talk about later, which can be used to produce more glucose within your body. They're called the glucogenic amino acids. So glucogenic, like 
sugar, glucose generating, glucose creating amino acids. We'll come back to those. We're also going to come back to the glycerol. But this is just a little heads up. All right. So with proteins, with amino acids, you can produce energy with all of your amino acids. But the amino acids kind of have, there's two different ways that they make energy. One group is called the glucogenic amino acids. Glucogenic amino acids. Those glucogenic amino acids can be produced, can be made into glucose. So glucogenic amino acids can be made into glucose. The glycerol from a triglyceride can be made into glucose. Glycogen can be broken down into glucose. Lactate can be turned into glucose. So we have all these different ways, all these different sources of material for creating new glucose. And once all these sources have been turned into glucose, guess how we get energy from them? The story that was told in part one. The story that was told in part one of this video. So if you have a triglyceride, you can take the glycerol, combine it with another glycerol in your liver, and then it turns into glucose and you can make energy out of it just with the normal story that we talked about in part one, glycolysis, activation, Krebs cycle, electron transport. Some amino acids, if they're a glucogenic amino acid, same thing. Glucogenic amino acids get turned into glucose, then they go through glycolysis, activation, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. You break down glycogen and it releases glucose. Guess what? Same thing if you want to produce energy from it. Glucose goes through glycolysis, activation, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. So all these things can get turned into glucose and then that goes through this normal story that we've told last time. Glycolysis, activation, Krebs cycle, electron transport. Most of this gluconeogenesis happens in the liver. A small amount can happen in the kidneys. So the liver is the main spot, but it can happen in the kidneys too. All right. Um, We'll get to the ketogenic amino acids shortly. So now let's look at aerobic. Let's continue on through these slides. So now we're doing aerobic. So with aerobic, we have glycolysis, pyruvate activation, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. Know where these happen, know what goes in and what comes out of each step. Glycolysis, six carbon glucose goes in, you spend two ATP, you get two pyruvates, and four ATP, you profit two ATP. You also get two NADHs. If you're doing anaerobic respiration, those NADHs get turned back into NAD+. Those pyruvates get turned back, turned into lactate, and they can go and be turned back into glucose. If you're doing aerobic, you get those two NADHs are gonna end up going to the mitochondria for electron transport chain, remember. NADH is a high energy electron carrying molecule, and you're gonna use those high energy electrons to create ATP in the electron transport chain. So pyruvate activation, perfect. Again, we're making more high energy electrons for electron transport chain. We're also losing a, a one carbon per pyruvate. There's some CO2 going off there. Krebs cycle, so remember the input for Krebs cycle because it's gonna be important for what we're about to talk about. So the acetyl-CoA, the two carbon acetyl-CoA goes into our citric acid cycle and we get one turn. Now this equation down here has two acetyl-CoAs because we started with one glucose, we got then two pyruvates and then two acetyl-CoAs. 
So it's one acetyl-CoA per turn, we get two turns per glucose. Electron transport chain, perfect. So earlier I talked about how in glycolysis we get ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. In citric acid cycle, we also get some substrate level phosphorylation ATP right here. See it says ADP to ATP right here. That is substrate level phosphorylation right here. Oxidative phosphorylation happens in the electron transport chain. Oxidative phosphorylation is what happens in the electron transport chain. If it happens outside the electron transport chain, substrate level phosphorylation. In the electron transport chain, if you put that third phosphate group onto ADP turn into ATP, substrate, sorry, oxidative phosphorylation if it happens in the electron transport chain. All right, so um, this term chemiosmosis. So if you remember, we use those high energy electrons from NADH and FADH2 to pump hydrogens into the intermembranous space. We then use that concentration gradient um, where the hydrogens want to flow back into the mitochondrial matrix, they flow through ATP synthase, which through the power of oxidative phosphorylation puts that inorganic phosphate back onto ADP turning to ATP. Well, this idea that hydrogen um, ions, the gradient of hydrogen ions is used to make ATP is called chemiosmosis. Also remember from last time, that for every NADH you make, you get about three ATP. For every FADH2 you make, you get about two ATP. Oxygen is required as it's the ultimate electron acceptor, oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so right here, it says if you create if you have NADH in your mitochondria, you get three ATP. That's what we've said up to this point so far. Up here it says cytoplasmic NADH. So NADH that's created during glycolysis, you get three or two ATP. I'm gonna explain that. This next slide explains that. So where do you cash in your NADH to make you, where do you cash in your NADH to get ATP? You cash it in in the electron transport chain. Where is the electron transport chain? The electron transport chain is in the mitochondria. If your NADH is created in the mitochondria like it is in the Krebs cycle, the NADH just goes right next door, creates three ATP. If that NADH is created in glycolysis, that NADH is in the cytoplasm. And that NADH needs to enter into the mitochondria before it can be cashed in to make ATP. The way your body moves that cytoplasmic NADH into the mitochondria is different in different tissues. I'm gonna repeat that. NADH created in citric acid cycle is already in your mitochondria. It just goes right next door and into the electron transport chain, boom, no energy lost. Three ATP per NADH. With NADH that's produced in the cytosol during glycolysis, you have to transport that NADH into the mitochondria before you can produce ATP from it. And the way that that NADH is transported into the mitochondria is different in different tissues. They're called the mitochondria electron shuttles. So in the heart and liver, it's something called the malate aspartate shuttle. The malate aspartate shuttle has no loss of energy. You move those high energy electrons from your NADH onto an NADH within the mitochondria and they lose no energy. Three ATP is produced. So 
no energy is lost from cytoplasmic NADH being moved in the mitochondria in the heart or liver. None. In skeletal muscle, you use something called the glycerol phosphate shuttle. Something called the glycerol phosphate shuttle. In the glycerol phosphate shuttle, you transfer those high energy electrons on your NADH into the mitochondria and onto an FAD, making an FADH2. Some energy is lost. How many ATP do you get for an FADH2? Two, right? Two. So for every um, NADH that needs to transfer their electrons into the mitochondria in skeletal muscle, you lose one ATP worth of energy. Now you get two mitochondrial NADHs per glucose. So per glucose molecule in skeletal muscle, you'll lose a total of two ATP possible because of this glycerol phosphate shuttle. This idea right here is a really common spot for people to miss points on the exam for. It has to do with how those high energy electrons are transported from the cytosol into the mitochondria. In the heart and liver, no energy is lost. NADH on the outside, NADH on the inside. In skeletal muscle with the glycerol phosphate shuttle, we produce, an NA, we produce two NADHs in the cytosol per glucose. We transfer those electrons into the mitochondria. We lose some energy and they go on to an FAD plus, making an FADH2. We lose one ATP per time we do that. We do it twice per glucose, so we lose two ATP per glucose. Please let me know if you have questions on this. It's one of the tougher students often miss points on this. All right, so the complete oxidation of glucose. Let's look at these summary charts. So ATP used by glycolysis. We spend two ATP, we make four ATP. Substrate level phosphorylation, we make four ATP. We also produce two NADHs, two NADHs during glycolysis. We produce zero FADH2s during glycolysis. In this chart, AT, in indirect ATP is defined as ATP via oxidative phosphorylation. So during glycolysis with one glucose, we produce two NADHs in the cytoplasm. In the heart and liver, we can transfer those high energy electrons from the cytoplasmic NADHs into the mitochondria with no energy lost. So three ATP per NADH, three times two is six, we get six indirect ATP. Six indirect ATP from the NADH plus four substrate level phosphorylation, we get 10 total ATP. 10 total ATP minus the two ATP used, eight ATP is what we profit because of glycolysis in the heart and liver. Let's see how that changes in skeletal muscle. So in skeletal muscle, we spend, we have one glucose molecule, we spend two ATP to get the process started. We make four uh, ATP substrate level phosphorylation directly. We produce two NADHs, but those NADHs need to move their electrons into the mitochondria in order for us to produce ATP. And they move their electrons through the mitochondrial membrane onto an FAD, making it an FADH2. FADH2 produces two ATP per molecule. So two ATP per, two, um, sorry, two ATP per molecule times two molecules, we get four indirect if we're in skeletal muscle. Four indirect if we're in skeletal muscle. Four plus four is eight total, minus the two that we use to get it going, six profit. ATP. Pyruvate, pyruvate activation is the same every time. We have 
uh, we profit two NADHs. NAD, it, these NADHs are already in the mitochondria. There's no need to transport these NADHs into the mitochondria. So every time, no matter what tissue it's going to be, it's going to be NADH, two molecules made, times three ATP each, six ATP indirect, six total. Krebs cycle. We produce two ATP via substrate level phosphorylation for two cycles because we're putting them two acetyl-CoA's. We get six NADHs. These NADHs are already in the mitochondria. They don't need to be transported anywhere. They're where they need to be. So and no matter what tissue it's going to be, we're always going to get six NADHs. So six NADHs times three is 18. FADH2, once again, already in the mitochondria. We're good to go. Two molecules times two ATP per is four. 18 plus four gives us 22 indirect. 22 indirect plus two direct gives us 24 total. We didn't spend any profit. 24 ATP for the Krebs cycle. We also lose four carbon, so make sure you know where the CO2s are coming from. Here is the big summary chart for in the heart and liver. Here's the big summary chart for in skeletal muscle. Please, you definitely want to know why it's different for the heart and liver and why it's different for skeletal muscle. If you have questions on it, please let me know. All right, so carbohydrate um, catabolism is about 40% efficient. Where is that energy lost? That, that inefficiency is lost via heat. Transferring that energy from the bonds within glucose to the bond between ATP or ADP and that phosphate turned ATP, energy is lost because it's not perfectly efficient. It's lost to heat energy, lost to heat energy. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting is you can see right here, we have glucose, how much energy is in glucose. We add a little bit of energy via ATP. We add a little energy via ATP. Then we take a bunch of energy out because of NADH. Then we take a little bit out because of ATP. We take a little bit out because of ATP. We take a bunch out because of NADH. And you kind of see how we're going down there. All right. So we're going to add more flare now onto this framework that we have. So each triglyceride produces 400 to 500 ATPs. We've already talked about what happens to the glycerol backbone in a triglyceride. That glycerol backbone can go into gluconeogenesis and be turned back into glucose. And then it goes through this story, just as we talked about as glucose goes through this metabolism process. But that leaves us with these fatty acid chains, these fatty acid chains. So let's see this, what goes on. So lipid catabolism, breaking down a lipid. So lipolysis. So lipo is lipid, lysis is cleaving. We're breaking down a lipid from a polymer to a monomer. This is means we need to, step one in turning a triglyceride into energy, step one for turning a triglyceride into energy is to break apart the molecule, separate the glycerol from the fatty acid chains. Separate the glycerol from the fatty acid chains. Polymer to monomer called lipolysis. This happens in the cytosol using an enzyme called lipase. That triglyceride is gonna turn into a glycerol in three fatty acid chains. The glycerol can get turned into a glucose molecule. Um, glycerol has three carbons, glucose has six, so you need two glycerols to make a glucose molecule. How many ATP do you get from one glucose molecule? About 40, as we saw up here, 38, 40. So half of it, one glycerol, gives you about 20 ATP. See where that's coming from? So gluconeogenesis for the glycerol. The FA is fatty acid. Fatty acid is going to move on to beta oxidation. 
So beta oxidation is gonna happen in the mitochondria. So we're gonna take this fatty acid chain and we're gonna move it into the mitochondria. So take the fatty acid, move it into the mitochondria, the mitochondrial matrix. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut off two carbons from this fatty acid chain. We're gonna combine it with a coenzyme A that turns it into acetyl-CoA. We're gonna cut off the next two carbons. We're gonna attach a coenzyme A, turns into acetyl-CoA, boom. Where do you recognize acetyl-CoA? Do you know where acetyl-CoA is gonna come in in this story? Citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. For every two carbons that you cut off this fatty acid chain, you're gonna combine it with an acetyl co with a, a coenzyme A, and you're gonna get a turn of the citric acid cycle. So think about how many carbons, how long this carbon chain is. Every two, every two carbons is gonna give you one spin of the citric acid cycle. And that's where most of the ATP is gonna come from for these triglycerides. So triglyceride has three fatty acid chains. Each fatty acid chain has a whole bunch of carbons. That's a lot of turns of the citric acid cycle. So I'm gonna repeat this again. For, so you start off the triglyceride. Step one is in the cytosol, you need to break apart the components. So separate the glycerol from the fatty acids. Glycerol goes into gluconeogenesis, turns into glucose, glucose, normal glucose story that we've gone over. We then have the fatty acid in the cytosol. We need to move it into the mitochondrial matrix or into the middle of the mitochondria. We are then going to do beta oxidation in the mitochondrial matrix where we're going to break off the little pieces of this fatty acid chain, two carbons at a time, combine it with a coenzyme A, turn it into acetyl-CoA. And where do we know acetyl-CoA? We know acetyl-CoA as the input molecule for Krebs cycle. So for every acetyl-CoA you put it in the Krebs cycle, we get one spin of the Krebs cycle. And then we get some substrate level phosphorylation via Krebs cycle, but we get a lot of these high energy electrons. They go next door to the electron transport chain. We get a lot of ATP via oxidative phosphorylation via the electron transport chain. It is important to note this requires O2. Electron transport chain requires O2. All right, now, how do we get energy from proteins? So we've mentioned this briefly before. We're gonna dive a little deeper now. So you have a protein. First thing you need to do is break it into its monomers. You need to proteolyse, break apart the protein. Go from a polymer to monomer. The enzyme is a protease that does this. You go from a protein to amino acids, individual amino acids. Once you have individual amino acids, you need to separate out the NH3 group. You need to take off the amine group. The amine group is not gonna be used for producing energy. So we're gonna take off the NH3 group, and then there's a process where our bodies get rid of that NH3. And that's actually a source of, of urea. Actually a source of, of urea, which we, we urinate out. Once we've done this, once we've gone from polymer to monomer, once we've gotten rid of the amino acid, sorry, once we've gotten rid of the amine group, we can then do energy production. Some amino acids are considered glucogenic, which means that they get turned into glucose via gluconeogenesis. We've mentioned this earlier. Others are considered ketogenic. The ketogenic ones are broken into two carbon chains, combined with coenzyme A, and stuck into Krebs cycle. So it's just like this right here. They get turned into ketogenic amino acids, get turned into inputs for the Krebs cycle. Inputs for the Krebs cycle. So glucogenic, 
it turned into glucose, go through the glucose story. Ketogenic, it turned into cohen, um, acetyl-CoA's. Acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle, and then all those high energy electrons from uh, Krebs cycle go on to electron transport. We get more energy from electron transport. All right, so carbohydrates and anaerobic conditions. Carbohydrates are the only ones for anaerobic. All these others required oxygen. So carbohydrates for anaerobic respiration. For aerobic respiration, we have carbohydrates which go through glycolysis and then go through activation, then go through Krebs, then oxidative phosphorization or electron transport. Lipids, they need to be lipolysed. The glycerol, can then be turned into a glucose, a carbohydrate. The fatty acids then go into beta oxidation, go into Krebs cycle, and then those high energy electrons from Krebs cycle go into oxidative phosphorization. Proteins need to do proteolysis, so they need to be broken down into amino acids. The amine group needs to be removed from them during the uh, deamination process. And then some of them are like um, glucogenic, so they'll go through glycolysis, then activation, then Krebs, then electron transport. Others are ketogenic. The ketogenic ones are going to join the story right at the Krebs cycle, right at the Krebs cycle. They get turned into acetyl-CoA's, put into Krebs cycle, and then any high energy electrons move on to oxidative phosphorization. So you see why I started when I, when I teach this lecture, I always start with like the story of a glucose molecule, and we do glucose, then activation, then um, Krebs cycle, then electron transport, phosphorylative oxidative, oxidative phosphorylization. You see why we started with that? Because glucose goes through like all the different steps of metabolism. It goes through all four of those main steps. And then all these other things that we can use to produce ATP, they join this story at different points. They kind of interact with this story at different points. You know, you have your lipids, which are being turned into acetyl-CoA's and going into, uh, into your Krebs cycle. You have your glycerols, which are being turned into, you know, turned back into glucoses, which are going into glycolysis and so on. So make sure you study in low part one of this video and then see how everything else interacts based off of that original framework that I gave. A few other things, the human body stores most of its energy in lipids. Fats are where most of the energy is stored in our body. ATP needs to be constantly reproduced, constantly made. If our bodies just stopped making ATP, we'd have enough stored ATP to live for like a matter of seconds. Like we're always making more ATP constantly because ATP is not like a storage molecule. It's like a you make it and you use it type of molecule. We're always making and always using ATP. Uh, creatine phosphate is another one that helps us just store a very short amount of, of, AT, of energy. Simple sugars, I mean, we have glucose levels, we maintain glucose levels, but without other mechanisms, that really wouldn't power us for very long. Um, complex carbohydrates, so glycogen, glycogen gets broken down into simple sugars, helps us maintain that proper blood glucose levels. Um, glycogen, we have enough glycogen to help us run on a matter of hours you know, four to six hours or so. Um, and it's not exact, but, you know, we have enough glycogen to function for, for a while. Uh, with lipids, when you bring lipids in, we can, we can function for a long time. I mean, we can go days without eating. All right, so ATP, inefficient, inefficient storage. We use about 10 million per muscle contraction we regenerate small pools, enough for a few X seconds of exercise. So yeah, we only have enough mitochondria, I'm sorry, we only have enough ATP at any one time for a few seconds of energy. We're always, or exercise, we're always making more. 
Uh, creatine is a high energy phosphate shuttle, accepts uh, ATP from the mitochondria, donates to the cytoplasm. So creatine helps us move energy out of the mitochondria. So it's a high energy phosphate shuttle. It accepts ATP from the mitochondria, donates it to ADP from the cytoplasm. It moves phosphate groups from the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. And this allows us to you know, survive a little bit longer, seconds longer. Um, simple sugars, this is important number to know. Um, I want you to know that a simple sugar there's four kilocalories per gram. If you have a gram of glucose, there's about four kilocalories of that. calories stored fat enough to run yeah, so think about it there. Right there,